Welcome back, everyone. This is Chase. And joining me again, Bruce Johnson from his home in, in Olympia, Washington, for another History of Gear series. This one, diving into the history of Frostline kits. One more of these great boulder-based companies that kind of started around the same, I guess not the same time period, but around the same era generally, right? As, as you know, along with yes. Jerry and Holubar. And a lot of connections between these these three companies that we'll dive into today. Thanks for joining me, Bruce. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, this is an interesting story. It was the actual uh, genesis, you might say, of my writing my history of gear books. The founder of this Frostline company, Dale Johnson, he was the guy who actually uh, <laughs> said, "Bruce, you should write a book. You've got all this stuff. You should write a book." And I was like. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. So here's a picture of him to get started. He sent me this picture, uh, which dates to 2006. He's at his home in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And I wanted to read about one paragraph of what he wrote me. And I put it in, in the book. He wrote... It does make me feel old when someone starts writing a history of one's company, especially when that company is, among many others, no longer in existence. I like to think of that time as the golden age of outdoor companies, a time of great innovation and invention, of new ideas and exploration. It was a time when America made its own products rather than outsourcing them. It was a time when regulation was at a minimum and the marketplace changed annually rather than hourly. Um, then he says some nice things about me, but um, you might remember in a past podcast, I referred to generally the period of the 60s as being like the golden age of gear when so many companies sprouted up and had so many new products. I actually got that term from Dale Johnson. He didn't call it the golden age of gear. He called it the golden age of outdoor companies. But that's where I, I got the idea of calling it the golden age. Uh, Jerry and Holly Barr, they actually got started before the golden age, what I call the golden age. Uh, they created, you might say, a foundation of products and and interest but as i indicated in those other podcasts they were more toward a hardcore mountaineering group and in the 60s it all sprouted out into families and just more average people getting out backpacking and hiking and some climbing but not the big hardcore climbing expeditions to the himalayas thing so this is dale johnson and uh, his company went through many phases and he was not actually part of the whole last half of the company these labels start off with the frost line Boulder, Colorado, 1966. They grew like crazy. They needed a bigger factory. Broomfield, Colorado. And they grew like crazy again. Now they're located, big headquarters building in Denver. <clears throat> and then huge crash, failed takeover by a, a Gillette Corporation. And a tiny group takes them over in Grand Junction and the label changes somewhat. And that company struggles and struggles and struggles and struggles for something like 25 years before it finally is gone forever. So this company, I'm glad that you kind of gave an overview of, of some of the high and low points, right? And, and the fact that Dale was involved in the beginning, started it, got it going, the company does well, there's kind of a boom when it comes to people making their own products. 
company sells and then it has kind of a rocky history after that. Um, yes. If, if we can, can go back to the beginning a little bit, what you, you said that Dale was kind of influenced by these, these initial founders, right? By the Jerry's, the Holy bars. He was growing up in Boulder where so much of this activity was happening by these pre golden era, golden age, uh, outdoor founders. How? What was the environment that he was growing up in in Boulder? He and his wife Julie were they growing up aware of of Holy Bar of Jerry and those products, and were they using them at that time? Yes, indeed. He was actually trained as a geologist and worked for a while in the uh, as a geologist in the oil fields of that would be Western Colorado. Uh, but it didn't suit him very well. And in approximately 1958, uh, he joined his, his wife, who had been working for Jerry, for Jerry Cunningham. She was sewing uh, their high-end mountain tents in their apartment. And he was just sort of hanging out, I guess, and hung out with Jerry. And next thing you know, uh, He's gotten extremely interested in what Jerry's doing and actually joins Jerry as kind of a partner for several years. During that time, he was exposed to Jerry's You Make It kits, which was an effort by Jerry to have kits, but it was more or less you just get plans and then you buy fabric and you have to lay it all out and cut it all, all out yourself. And Dale thought that was not uh, a good thing. It was not user friendly and it sort of set the seed that he was going to do something better. So when he and uh, Jerry split up, uh, which would have been sometime in the early sixties, he went to work for a bank in Denver and spent the next few years riding a, a bus back and forth to Denver from Boulder, busily engaged with little notebooks, sketching out products and creating. I'll, I'll bring one out here. Kit making booklets for each kit. And <clears throat> So at first he had only a few products and he had to source all the materials, the down, the fabrics, the zippers, the snaps, the everything. Um, so he only had a few products at first, but it expanded and expanded and expanded like, like crazy. Um, by the time he's the, into the mid 70s he's a huge company has tons of employees an enormous mailing list and the catalog has just close to a hundred products i'm just right. sort of and all of this is so your own right you you buy a kit and all the materials all the thread all the buckles all the buttons comes with it and you sew it yourself right and that's How it who else was doing this when, when he went to work for Jerry? Do you have any idea what the first, were there first companies that were doing kits? Was Jerry one of the first? Who else was doing kits at that time? No, Jerry was it. Jerry was it. So how, how did that work for, kit. Oh yeah. I got to show these things. Yeah. Because I, I dragged them out. He was even doing after a few years, bicycle packs. Wow. This is a kit for bicycle pannier, a front uh, pannier. Um, and so, no, uh, as far as I know, Jerry was, was it with his line of you make it kits. Right. And, uh, and then there was a gap, really. Um, Jerry kind of dropped doing that. Um, and then... Uh, Dale got online in 1966. Yeah. What What else was Jerry? What What else was Dale doing for the company? Was he solely working for the 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 kit 
side of the business? Was he working on other products? I, I seem to remember you maybe mentioning something about him working on the apparel side of the business. Was he involved in that, the, the Olympic coats that we, we saw and the popularity of those growing? I think you mentioned something about him being involved in the apparel side. Of well, the you have a good memory there, Chase. Um, yeah, the uh, apparel side of, of Jerry was mostly just very functional down jackets, like for climbers and just functional things. Dale Johnson and a local guy, a local university student, uh, George Lamb, uh, who, as you remember, George Lamb had the only walking foot uh, sewing machine that could sew real heavy leather. And so he was part of some of the Jerry products. And those two were interested in downhill skiing and they got into creating kind of on the side of Jerry, right there, like an offshoot of Jerry that Jerry wasn't very interested in creating more downhill skiing stuff. And that became also a big part of the Frostline kits eventually, where they had downhill ski type apparel kits. Right. It's, it's interesting that uh, they started pushing more into the apparel side of things where Jerry was so focused on equipment and now you look at Jerry and apparel is their whole business, right? Yes. And, and we kind of see a lot of these equipment gear companies, they realize we got to sell apparel because apparel, you know, more everyday people, kind of like you mentioned, people who aren't scaling mountains, uh, just your average person who needs to go outside and stay warm will buy these things, right? So they, it's interesting that they kind of started down that track of, you know, obviously making jackets for downhill and for use on the mountain but i imagine some of those things would cross over and appeal to a more general audience yeah um and as somebody else pointed out to me mm, might have been don wittenberg uh apparel is what provides a steady income stream to companies uh you make packs you make good packs they last forever you don't have return customers coming back every year buying packs same thing with tents, same thing with sleeping bags. So it's apparel that really drives your oncoming income stream. Right. So did, did they just disagree with Jerry? Was there some kind of disagreement or Jerry just wasn't interested in, in, I guess, the direction that they were taking things and they realized, oh, there's, there's a business here for kits. Well, let's go do our own thing. Was, what was some of that internal dynamic? Was there some kind of a disagreement or did they just, you know, just kind of go and, and do their own thing. That is lost in history. Um, I don't think they became enemies, but uh, uh, Dale split off from uh, Jerry and went his own path. Uh, he was like, uh, like Jerry, he was a very independent, inventive guy. And um, Frostline Kits, um, as I indicated, he had to source all these materials himself initially. I, um, he had to invent uh, one of the key products for creating down gear uh, was some way to have consumers deal with down. Yeah, that's the other interesting piece, right? Is if you were getting a, a sleeping bag kit, they'd send you this down, right? And you'd have to find a way to, to put it in the chambers, right? And then sew yeah. it up. So he invented these down packets and <clears throat> they come in different sizes for different compartments in your sleeping bag or jacket. And when you have the compartment sewed and ready, there's a little flap and you pull this up and insert it and push it through. Pretty slick. You only get a million feathers all over instead of everything. Yeah, right. So who was helping him in the early days design all these patterns? You said he ended up, some of these catalogs ended up having hundreds, you know, a hundred plus products in there. Who designed all of this? Did he pick up some design skills and know-how from his time with Jerry? His wife was sewing gear. Was it a combination? How did they? Yeah, it was, it was that way. It was uh, not any kind of formal process that he'd been trained for. This was his very first catalog. 
super small and super simple, just a few products uh, that he designed. The Kodiak two-man tent. It went lots of rough and tough places over the years. But the company grew, he says, uh, it doubled its sales every single year for many years and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And of course, they, they started hiring a real crew of people, right? Right. How Advertising did... people, design people, and people, of course, uh, many people actually doing the sewing and the mailing. And, the, you know, they had a big deal operation going on after a while. Yeah. So in those first couple of years, what were some of their key products? You mentioned the tent. What were some of those best sellers in the first first couple of years? Was it more equipment or was it more the apparel side? Um, so if, if we look at uh, their second catalog, basically you've got a couple of designs of tents and you've got <clears throat> a couple of designs of sleeping bags three or four different coats and jackets. So kind of a variety right at the beginning of the company. It wasn't just one thing. It was, they were kind of across the board. Yeah. And um, one of their very biggest down products was the down vest because it was easy. Right. It was the yeah. easiest thing to sew. Uh, they did a few things, a wind parka <clears throat> and a rain parka good old-fashioned poncho yep rain chaps uh they also sold the raw materials for people who really wanted to be out there and designing so, their own stuff so if you just wanted to get a roll of fabric you could just get a roll of fabric from them and the notions the right. thread the, yeah the, the snap setting kits so the what, was the, uh, what was the appeal for people during this time? I, this was like, as you said, kind of the golden age. People were starting to become more conscious of the natural environment. Pe more people wanted to get outside. More outdoor gear was hitting the market, you know, post-World War II, right? There's just more gear that's out there. Was it those combinations of things that, that led people to want to make their own stuff? What was it that drew people to sewing up their own gear rather than buying something from a Jerry or, or from another brand that, that already existed. Um, Dale said he had four, four pillars, right. Of the business. And one of them was price, save a bunch of money. And I can speak more about that later on. Cause in the later history of the company that came back to not work so much anymore yeah. once everything was getting outsourced what was the Asia. what was the uh cost if you were to compare a jacket that you'd buy from from another store to a, a jacket kit i guess how how big of a price difference would there be another point uh that he made in his four points was quality to answer your question you have to say well, let's compare a quality down jacket from say Jerry or Holly bar with what you can sew up. And the price was less than half. Now, of course you could buy a piece of junk somewhere for fairly cheap, even before Asia. But, uh, so if you're comparing apples to oranges, you could probably think you're paying like maybe 40% to get a really nice down sleeping bag for right. instance. Right. Makes sense. I wanted to put this up. Um, I was looking around desperately for some Frostline product that I still had that I sewed. And the only thing I still have are my, uh, my, my low gaiters. The thing about these is I still have them and they have lasted really well all these years i um actually custom modified these ones with some ideas of my own uh, uh creating a, a a breathable inner layer to reduce condensation um right now the only thing they they need to put them back in action is i i need to put in some new elastic around the top what were the other two pillars i think i derailed uh, us 
terrific customer service um, and a total like you have any problem with this you know just return it return a half made kit because you got too frustrated with it so those were the main pillars there wow. and That's, they and they they did they had excellent toll-free phone lines and uh, they try to help you over the phone and so they had a good operation going right and most people found out about the company through their their catalogs how did they get their first mailing list I know it seemed like Jerry and Holya Bar found unique ways to get mailing lists or get access to, to ways to send catalogs out to people how did uh, how did uh, Frostline do that That's an interesting question. I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, their catalog operation was enormous after a few years. Um, and I could say a lot more about that, but uh, uh, it was catalogs. They had an enormous operation, beautiful catalogs that went out, uh, special catalogs that went out in between the annual catalogs. And, uh, um, a whole team of people creating right. I, these these uh, catalogs um well as you know with a company the mailing list is a prized mm -hmm. and indispensable resource right it's their connection to the customer right and then eventually they start to open up retail stores how long did it take for them to open up a store and and where was that they opened a whole chain of stores uh in the uh, 70s so they had to expand out quite a bit in their first four or five years. And then they just started putting out stores and eventually they had something like 12 or 15. Yeah, I saw we had a Salt Lake store there. Yeah, you had a Salt Lake store. Um, in those retail stores, it was purely kits. You'd go in and, and buy kits or were there some sewn up items if you wanted to try something on? What was that experience like at the store? They had display items, of course, and try-on items. But one thing most people don't know or remember is you could buy products ready-made, but on a very limited scale. Uh, my uh, younger sister was uh, in upholstery school in Portland, Oregon, uh, and they had a store in the uh, Portland area that she sewed for as kind of like a sideline way to make money of course she made all sorts of other products for me <laughs> and for herself the reason that Frostline is so important uh in my book is because unlike buying products from north face or sierra designs or whoever it was um there is a, an, an immense thrill in making something yourself figuring out how to do it and wearing this thing that you made <laughs> you you made it it's really yours it's not just something you paid some money to buy it's you made it and maybe you customized it as well right uh, and I, I i got so many emails in the early days when i was just building my website from frost blind customers who were just crazy about their old frostline gear and they just wanted to send me pictures and the stuff by then is like 30 40 years old so when did you discover frostline oh pretty much right near its beginning those uh beat up old gators i sewed those in 1968 you know i i love what you said about i can see why that would resonate with people and why that was so impactful and and I imagine there were so many people at that time who loved that feeling. Um, how, how popular was the company at, a, at its high point? So, you know, pre-1978 when they get acquired. I guess what were some of the high points of the company during, during those years that Dale was involved? You can see from the network of stores that they were able to establish and fund. Uh, that was a big deal. And they had many millions of dollars I, i'm trying to remember what the company eventually sold to for to gillette but it was something like whatever 25 million dollars or something like that which back then was a big deal um 
And they were sending out, I believe their mailing list had over 40,000 on it. And they had a lot of recognition, uh, name recognition in the outdoor community, uh, far beyond people who were making kits. It was lots of people who knew people who were making the kits and wearing the kits and seeing the kits out in the woods. Right. Do you feel like that? So while Dale was running the company and at, at its high point, do you feel like it influenced a generation of, of people who would eventually be a part of the outdoors, part of the outdoor industry? And um, I, I guess are, are there, do you, have you heard any stories of people who got introduced to, to frost line and, and that helped them develop a love for, for a product and, and maybe that led to other companies being founded. I know we talked about that with Jerry, you know, Jerry mm-hmm. kind of spawned other companies out of it. Did, did that, was there that same effect with Frostline where you put in the hands of people, the ability to make a product? Yeah, there were um, several people that I'm aware of who later on started a company. Now, did they start a company because of Frostline? Hard to say exactly, but uh, it's surprising how many of these, these uh, founders uh, or people who ended up in high places in some of the companies, uh, they were just casually mentioned, oh, yeah, yeah, when I was sewing Frostline kits, it was something that they, they often did and they knew about and they, they uh, saw it as a valuable thing. Right, you know, right. Some crazy uh, uh, brief interlude in the history of gear. Um, you know, I should point out uh, when you say, well, how successful did the company get? Well, success breeds uh, imitation, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> by the time Jerry was, uh, or Jerry um, Frostline was several years old uh, by the mid 70s, there were just gear companies doing kits everywhere. There were so many of them. I've got probably at least 10 or 12 different catalogs, these little places doing kits. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I had that in my notes. I, I figured I'd read off a couple of them. I don't know if sure. these were all around that same time, but Ultra Kits. Uh, yeah, that was one of the really big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Is it May, May Kits? Ma Kits? Uh, that was Jerry's. Okay. Uh, Country Ways, Cascade Kits, Calico Kits. Colorado Sun Kits, Kangaroo, Rainbow Country, which you showed. Um, Nor- Let's see, Sierra Cascade, Sundown, EMS, REI, uh, Symmetry, Timberline, The Daisy Kingdom, uh, Plain Brown Wrapper Kits. Yeah. Um, and I think you said here, there's a, that's about 16 or so. Um, it, did they kind of all spawn out of just after... Frostline really started taking off. Did you yeah. see like every few years after that, a few would spring up? Exactly. Uh, success uh, breeds imitation, and there was a big market for these. Uh, one of the markets that Frostline uh, developed uh, and had a whole staff working on was getting kits into schools. So instead of uh, having to bake cakes, kids could opt to make a pack. Right. Frostline had a whole division devoted to getting kits out into the schools, into the uh, hands of teachers. That's really interesting because I, so I work for the outdoor product design program at, at the university here. And, and one of the things that we've found is in the, in the schools in Utah, um, you know, there's kind of and nationally, right. There's been a decline in interest in sewing and, mm-hmm. and, you know, the so-called home ec, um, programs and uh, you know with the resurgence of a program like ours and an interest in in the outdoor industry and careers in the outdoor industry um, you, we've seen some of the classes in in these traditionally you know home ec um, programs they start to call them sports sewing there you go and and the <laughs> students start to sew outdoor products um, and that, that kind of spurs this, this interest in the craft. Whereas, you know, rather than sewing a, I don't know, a pot holder, or, you know, whatever it is, or oven mitts, you're making something that you're really interested in. Um, they were way ahead of the curve. It sounds like thinking about that and thinking about getting people 
you know, teaching them how to make stuff they actually want to use. Exactly. So there was a big, uh, how do I want to say it? Uh, a lot of kids who never ended up in the industry sewed things that they went on to use and enjoy and look back on with pleasure. I sewed this, that sense of uh, pride, craftsmanship, if you will. Uh, a huge contribution, I think. Uh, a little hard to measure. Mm -hmm but out there. Yes. Right. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I had no idea. didn't know that. Um, you know, we kind of towards the end of Dale's experience with the company that it, it had become really profitable. It sounds like they had been doing really well as we've touched on. Um, how did the Gillette deal come about and Gillette of razor fame, which is yes. interesting. Doesn't seem like a, a great match, um, which we'll get into a little bit, but yeah, how did, how did that come about? you know, Dale getting connected with Gillette, the company. Dale, um, he was actually considerably older than Jerry. And so by the time he made a big success out of Frostline, he was getting to be, you might almost say like retirement motivated. And so he was consciously, very uh, planfully looking around to sell the company. And that's what he did. Yeah, nineteen. And he got a good price for it, and uh, he was able to uh, retire in, in style, you might say, um, thereafter, um, and pursue his his uh, great love of flying. And he was a big environmentalist and flew around all over the West, mapping out wilderness areas from the from the air. Um, so he got out on purpose. He didn't get bought out. He didn't get sucked down the hole like Jerry did. Do you know much about Gillette's motivations and, and what other products they owned at this time? I mean, obviously the, the razor business, were they, were they kind of in a buying mood during this time and just acquiring companies? What was it about Frostline that was so interesting to them at this time? Big successful company yeah. in, a, in a different area than they normally were in. Uh, they weren't like... Um, Polybar getting bought out by Johnson Wax, or Johnson Wax was a call, on purpose acquiring a whole bunch of outdoor brands. Right. Yeah. As far as I know, Gillette wasn't doing that same thing, at least not on that scale. And they, they bought into Frostline thinking it was a good deal, and that was right about the time that a whole lot of factors came together, and the company just didn't make it. To, and I, I didn't find that, uh, anybody in Frostline who was specifically saying, uh, Oh, this is the reason. It was like, eh, it just didn't really work out. They didn't understand our business very well. And uh, the, the idea that uh, so Kitch will save a lot of money started to really erode because of uh, uh, Asia. Uh, a lot of uh, outdoor products started to be made in Asia. And then the price differential started getting a, a, its throat cut. Yeah. So that's about what I know. Right. Yeah. It, it probably could have been a, a, a variety of factors that kind of led to the company failing during that time. But I imagine it's kind of the macro level, just like you said, just cheaper products coming, right. And becoming more available and people yeah. thinking, Oh, I could sit behind a sewing machine and try to put this together. or I could just buy one. Um, that's just as cheap. Um, mm -hmm. that, uh, there was also a workforce thing that went on in there about, uh, more and more and more American women went went to work. And so both man and woman were working now and their time kind of went away to be uh, sewing kits. Right, yeah. What happened with the company? So Gillette ends up, they just kind of sell, sell the assets and just kind of let it go away, right? Private in investors um, hmm. in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, bought up what was left of the company, the, the machines, the patterns, the remaining product, and uh, tried to make a go of it there in Grand Junction. Yeah, how did that go? So eight, 1983, that kind of happens. What what happened with the company during that time? Oh, they continued to produce uh, catalogs every year. Um, 
but the catalogs weren't glitzy and shiny anymore. Sometimes they looked more like newspapers. <laughs> and uh, they didn't have a team of designers. They weren't producing a bunch of great new stuff. Um, they were trying. Um, the first two people who were, they weren't the actual owners. The Clemens, you mentioned them, Shirley and Bob. Um, they weren't the actual owners, but they were like the day-to-day -day managers. She wrote to me, the down machines were wonderful. Well, these are machines that Dale Johnson invented and that made those little packets. Yeah. Um, I love blowing down and all that stuff. Didn't take long till we got good at it. Uh, I also enjoyed the hours and hours of cutting and assembling. I guess I just kind of liked it all. So, so these were people who liked what they were doing, even though it wasn't profitable and they had really lost the big national uh, reputation that the original Frost Line had had. And they were just trying to make it happen and trying to make it happen. Right. The mailing list, the Frost Line, uh, they had also um, achieved that, bought that anyway. And they had a computer guy there, believe it or not, way back then, a computer guy. Uh, who wrote to me that he had spent literally weeks on these primitive systems inputting the mailing list. So they had a mailing list still, uh, but Asia had really eroded the profitability and uh, there were a lot of things going against them. Right, so that kind of uh, continued for about 10 years. So 1983, you know, that gets bought from Gillette. And then 1994, it looks like it trades hands again. Mr. Clemens had passed away. Um, there was a connection made with McCall Patterns where they started to call themselves a subsidiary of McCall Patterns, which I thought, oh, uh, this could be good. But that dropped right out in, uh, within a year or so. And I don't know why. Um, yeah. And then, the, yeah, things really went downhill. They didn't have catalogs for several years. Uh, and then the company was apparently on the verge of just being taken over by uh, the government, by the county for bankrupt or something was going on there. And um, two other people bought it up, another husband, wife, couple, um, the Flowers, Kathy Flowers and her husband. Um, and they put out a... Uh, very glitzy catalog. Yeah, in 2001. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> with many, many products in it. And, you know, sure looked like a going deal. Um, so when I was doing my research, I was excited about these, these guys in Colorado. Um, and I'd call and I'd try to get to talk to somebody. I, there was never anybody who would answer the phone. Never. Not once. I called dozens of times. Uh, and I left messages uh, finally to get catalogs. And I got the catalog. Um, I continued my research uh, when I was contacted by somebody who had worked for them, the flowers, who had worked for them. And I had her going all over Grand Junction trying to track them down. And finally, there was an old warehouse in a rundown part of town. Uh, that had things hanging from the rafters, patterns, and it wasn't labeled frost line. There was no ID, uh, but apparently they were still selling somehow on a small scale. Because after a while, I was getting emails from people who thought I was frost line saying, Where's my stuff? I ordered something. Where's my stuff? Eventually, around 2008, I got some really funky stuff uh, that I won't go into it. I, it, it didn't, I, I think there was something going on with some kind of scam, but um, apparently uh, Frostline had ended up in the home of the flowers and uh, he had died. And there were Frostline sewing machines out in a driveway, either being sold at a, some kind of sale uh, or being packed up and taken away. And after that, 
uh, I lost the trail. I sent a letter to where I thought she was in uh, Eastern Colorado, but never got a reply. So the company, the story is a sad one. Yeah, it kind of at the end there, it just faded away. Yeah. Um, the demise of the last kit company, because all those many others that we talked about briefly, they were all long gone. Yeah, right. And Frostline went on and on and dragged on and on and on. And so I still was getting messages regularly, emails saying, I want to buy a Frostline kit. Where's the Frostline kit? Are you Frostline? I'm a historian. Um, and I would look around and see if there were kit companies that had arisen, you know, during the 2000s here. And there were a few leads, but mostly it was kind of back to where Jerry had been. You know, here's a pattern, or or maybe we'll we'll sell you some of the parts, but no kit booklet, no. It was not at all the same thing. So, to me, the do-it-yourself movement, as far as building your own gear, uh, there were a lot of factors that pushed it out. Yeah. It's a interesting because I, I feel like its impact is still felt, even if people can't trace it back, even if they don't know where to trace it back to. I mean, even companies that we see today, there's there's a movement around, you know, DIY, you know, do it yourself and repair and everyone wants something that's unique and, and feels handcrafted and handmade. Like there's that value there. People appreciate those things, um, especially in the outdoor industry. Um you know, and how many of those people can trace it back to, you know, some of these companies, um, you know, indirectly or directly. Um, but I think there's that DNA and, uh, you know, from the outdoor industry that was stamped by these companies, these kit companies, wouldn't you say? I would say it, that is to be prized. Um, if you had just had companies who uh, sold you stuff and never tried to educate you, about how you make it, or in the case of Jerry, you know, the, the ethic of uh, leave no trace, or the ethic of ultralight, or the ethic of, oh, the wilderness is for hiking with your family. Um, and Frostline is like, oh, you can make it yourself. Yeah. Imagine that. Right. Yeah, that's a great lesson. I think to be able to, to I don't know, if you were to, to say what the legacy of that company was would it be that yeah you can make it yourself yeah what uh so do you happen to know like we we've talked a little bit about the revival of brands and and some of these trademarks that just are kind of floating around do you have any idea you kind of lost the trail on on some of this but do you have any idea where the trademark for this company would exist does someone still own it ha <laughs> Yeah, I tried to uh, track it down. Finally, I uh, discovered that uh, Colorado, uh, of course, was where, where it was based. The company was based there. Uh, that there's a trademark there. I think it's the Secretary of State's office. And it, it's available. At least it was five, six years ago. And it was really cheap to buy it. Hmm. But I couldn't buy it because I wasn't a Colorado resident. Yeah. So it's still there. There's an opportunity for a revival. So we'll we'll do a part two if that ever happens. Yeah, think about it. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, any are there any other thoughts that you want to leave about this company, its legacy, its its impact? Uh, you know, it's it's one that before I got into this, I wasn't familiar with. But the more that I've I've been digging into it, the more I'm impressed by it, and and. Um, can kind of tie it into this, this longer history of the outdoor industry and, and see its impact and its, its connection. And, and I think its impacts are still felt whether people know mm -hmm. where to, you know, attribute that or not. That made me want to use another of my props. <laughs> so uh, right now, this is a little box that came from Frostline with a down vest kit in it. Years and years and years ago, uh, right now it's got a bunch of sewing material in it. Uh, 
And I just wanted to contrast, you order something online from North Face or whatever, and it comes in a little box and you're very excited. Imagine that time when you got a little box of mail, but what was in it was something that you were going to make. You were going to create it, and then you were going to wear it. People don't get to have that experience anymore. Yeah. Do you think there's still an opportunity for a brand to do that? Even some of these larger brands. Do you know of any brands that have done that? You know, like a Patagonia sending you pattern pieces that you sew up. Have you heard of anyone who's done that recently? Uh, a couple of the ultralight uh, companies uh, have done something like that for a few things, just a very few things. Um, it's not a it's not a big thing, and it's not at all widespread anymore. It's a piece of history, and I don't know if it's going to come back. But as you say, the do it yourself mentality is so important in the creation of products yeah and that's what you want to hold on to well i guess we'll just have to wait and see we'll yeah. uh we <laughs> won't close the door on this conversation conversation just yet then okay it's a deal so, well thanks again for taking time i it's so important to learn about these companies and and again you know we talked about this before we started recording but um you know again just have to call out the work that you've done because anytime i've looked up frostline kits you know, and there's other articles that have been written. They all reference your work and your website and the work that you've done. You've kind of been the source. Um, and it just hits home to me the importance of documenting the history, um, you know, of, you know, whatever it is that people are interested in, whether it's outdoor or not, right? Um, like you can be a historian. And, you know, in some cases, if you don't document it, who will, right? And And it's great that you did because every article that I've read, they they point back to you and your original, you know, the, the sources that you, you found and, and the things that you documented. So thanks for all your work. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Of course. Good course. to be on. Yeah, Glad to get you. the word out. Of course. Mm-hmm.